Hosanna, a loud Hosanna, the little children sing. Oh, I'm sorry. Here I was singing away, and, and there you are. Admittedly, I don't have a kind of voice for singing in front of audiences, but you know what? I've learned, I, I don't mind. After all, the voice that I have is the voice that God gave me. And the important thing is that he gave me something to sing about. And you know what? He's given you something to sing about too. No matter if you like to sing softly or loudly in the choir or in the shower, we have good reason to sing, just like the crowds that we will hear about in today's text in the account in Jesus' life that we have before us today. By the way, my name is John Holtz, and on behalf of Native Christians, I welcome you today. Thank you for joining me. I've been asked to share a message on this Sunday known as Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday? Well, because they cut down palm branches and they spread them on the road like some red carpet treatment. Well, I guess it was green at that time. But it's when Jesus entered Jerusalem and the crowds are all around him, some ahead of him, some behind him, some to the side of him shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then over the ages, various hymn writers have put this account in the life of Jesus into song, like the one that I was singing, Hosanna, a loud Hosanna. There's another one that I like, all glory, Lord, and honor. There's another neat one, right on, right on in majesty. And the one that's really kind of a bouncy tune, the king of glory comes, a nation rejoices. You know, it just kind of you just kind of want to stand up and sing and shout and praise Jesus. And maybe, maybe just maybe, you also have a question or two. Just like many did on that day that Jesus rode into town. He's riding into Jerusalem and and people are asking, Well, who is this? And of course, behind all of that, that question is maybe some other ones. You know, why all the commotion? Why all the shouts and the praise? Why cut down palm branches? Why toss your own garments on the ground so that a donkey can just step all over them? Who is this? You'll hear that question in our text for today, and we'll look at the answer as well. I'll read from Matthew chapter 21, 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. If you are joining us for the first time, I just want to let you know that the theme that all of our pastors have been using for these Sunday sermons in Lent, the ones leading up to Easter, including Easter, has been, y'all need Jesus. And if you've been following these sermons all along, you already know that already. But each week, the pastors have been using God's word, the accounts in the life of Jesus, to show us why we need him. Y'all need Jesus is not just a catchy slogan. It's not just a a cute little local lingo, but it speaks of a hard-hitting reality that you need Jesus and I need Jesus. Not just like some vending machine that we go to once in a while, but all the time. 
It's a realization that we cannot do without Jesus. Because without Jesus, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without Jesus, there is no eternal life in heaven. Without Jesus, we're lost and we can't find our way. Without Jesus, we're guilty and we can't get rid of it. Without Jesus, we're on the road to hell. We can't turn around. And even if I would try to do what Jesus did for me, I can't manage. And you can't either. And that's why we need him. We all need him in so many ways. Over the course of this Lenten season, we considered many of those ways of how we need Jesus. We needed Jesus to defeat Satan's temptations. We needed Jesus to heal our spiritual blindness and to give us eternal life. Today's scripture verses, we show that we need Jesus to ride into Jerusalem. By the way, speaking of riding into Jerusalem, it's so interesting that what occurs here in the Gospel of Matthew was already prophesied hundreds of years before by the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. We read in his book, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It was prophesied and it was fulfilled. What a day that was. But why? Why do we need him to ride into Jerusalem? You know, as you heard the story unfold in the Gospel of Matthew, what thoughts were running through your mind? Because it didn't sound all that bad, does it? I mean, Jesus is riding into town. He's receiving a hero's welcome. You know, it's almost like a championship sports team coming home after a big game. The people are crowding and shouting and praising, and here they're laying out that red carpet treatment. Okay, maybe the donkey ride wasn't the most comfortable. Maybe it's a little bit scratchy, but look at the reception that he's receiving. So really, what is the big deal here? Are you thinking, well, any one of us could have done that. Why did we need Jesus to do that? What's so hard about riding a few miles on the back of a donkey? Well, it's not so much about the ride on that animal, but what was going to happen to Jesus once he got to Jerusalem. And Jesus himself had foretold what would happen. In Matthew chapter 20, we read these words. He spoke to his disciples and said, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. See, that's why Jesus is going. This is some pretty bad stuff here. He's talking whips and thorns and blood and gore. And Jesus knew it. And he knew that that, as bad as it was, wasn't even going to be the worst of it. The worst of it was that his own father would abandon him. He was going to be suffering not just an agonizing, painful death on a cross, but hell itself. He would be experiencing the full wrath of his father directed against him. And he knew that what would happen to him, but you know what? He went ahead with it anyway. He told his disciples, this is the way it was going to be. And even when people like Peter tried to deter him, he said, no, it's got to be that way. He said, I want to be that way. I want it to be that way. Why? Because I'm doing it for you. And nothing would deter him. He went up. He, he went on resolutely. It's interesting because in the book of Isaiah, in the Old Testament, it says of Jesus, Therefore, I have set my face like flint. Flint, you maybe know, is a very hard quartz. It's so hard that when you strike it with steel, it, it produces a spark. And so to set one's face like flint is to be fiercely determined, immovable in your plan, unbending in your quest to do something. And even though terrible things would happen to Jesus, 
he wrote in any way. He set his face like flint. And when he entered Jerusalem, we read that the whole city was stirred, literally shaken. <laughs> in other places, this word is used in the context of an earthquake. Here, an earthquake was going on, but it wasn't in the land, but it was in the heart and in the mind. And it raised some questions like, who is this? And the crowds answered, well, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This text is just so wonderful and beautiful because it answers this question, who is Jesus, maybe more thoroughly than you first realize. Yes, the crowd said, this is the prophet, and he is the prophet. He's riding in as a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. He's also riding into Jerusalem as a priest and a king, too. These verses show him as prophet, priest, and king, and why we needed him to ride into Jerusalem. He rides in as a prophet. The crowd said that. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. But what did they have in mind when they regarded him as a prophet? Why do they say, this is Jesus, the prophet? Well, they knew what they knew. They saw what they saw. They heard what they heard. In Matthew chapter 4, we read these words. Jesus went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. See, Jesus was a prophet. He was speaking God's word. He was preaching. He was teaching. And what the people realized is no one ever spoke like he did. Why? Because they realized that he spoke with authority, not like the other ones. And so he paired his preaching and his teaching and his speaking with healings and teaching and casting out demons, and the people were in awe. So the news spread, people listened, people talked, people followed, and on top of what they could see with their eyes and hear with their ears, well, they already knew what the Old Testament said, because in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses had written, the Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything that I command him. I like the way Luther summarized these words. He said, this is the chief passage in this whole book, and a clearly expressed prophecy of Christ as the new teacher. Here Moses clearly describes his own end, and he yields his mastery to the prophet who is to come. Who is to come? And he came. And he still comes as a prophet through his word and sacrament. And that word still gets that same reaction. It causes a stir and people are shaken. Why? Because by nature, we don't want to hear what Jesus is saying. When he says repent in our stubborn, sinful nature, we say we have nothing to repent of. Or even if we do, we say, well, don't you tell me what to do. Jesus is saying that we need him, and by nature we respond, no, that's okay, I'm fine, thank you. He's saying we need a Savior, and we're saying, well, I am my own Savior. By nature, we don't want to hear that we are sinful. We don't want to hear that we're on the road to hell, that we can't do it on our own, that we need Jesus, but the truth is, we do. And even though we haven't always welcomed Jesus into our life, he still came. He came on the back of a donkey in humility and in love. He still comes as a prophet through his word. He still speaks. He still has something to say. And as you listen, you hear that he has good news. The gospel always is. By the way, has it been a while since you've heard good news? Ever struggle with the guilt of sin? or burdened with shame because of some bad things that you've done? 
Or maybe you're caught up in some really bad stuff right now and you have a hard time getting rid of it. Or what about all the good things that you realize that you didn't do? Well, I've got some good news for you, and here it is. It's from Psalm 103. God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Well, for me, that's good news. <laughs> to have my sins removed, to have my sins gone, never to condemn me. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Hmm? Well, wait, how did that happen? How did he remove my sin? Well, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that day, you see, he also rode in not just as a prophet with that great news, but he also rode, rode into Jerusalem as a high priest. See, the Old Testament priests, they would offer sacrifices again and again and again, first for himself and then on behalf of the people. And when there was a festival, a, a, a festivities and lots of people, boy, that city would be packed. And on this day, Jerusalem was packed. Jesus was entering a crowded city. And lots of people meant lots of lambs and lots of animals needing to be sacrificed. You can just imagine the smell and the blood and the fire, the commotion, the bleeding and the squeals. And now into all of this entered Jerusalem, Jesus. And what does he have to do with this? Well, in one sense, nothing. And in one sense, everything. Because listen to Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 to 27. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he, Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he sat when he offered himself. You see, so when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he rode in as a high priest, bringing the sacrifice. But the sacrifice that he's bringing is himself. <laughs> so he's not only the priest, but he's also the sacrifice. He's the lamb to be sacrificed. He is the sin offering, the offering that was given on our behalf. And because Jesus offered the sacrifice, our debt is paid. Our sin is no longer counted against us. And that's what David was saying in Psalm 103. It has been removed. You and I have been forgiven. The blood of the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. You see why he had to ride into Jerusalem? Because we couldn't do it. Even if we did ride into, into the city on the back of a donkey, and even if people nailed us on a cross, my death couldn't pay for my sins, much less yours or the sins of the world. My death couldn't count for everyone else's salvation. I'm not the perfect lamb without blemish. And neither are you. But Jesus was. And Jesus' death counted for everyone. No more lambs. No more dead sacrifices just living ones. Listen to what Romans chapter 12, 1 to 2 says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will able to be test to be able to be to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We have an opportunity to give our lives to the Lord. You may not raise or own any animals, maybe some of you do. But realize this, you and I each have, let's say, a donkey to give for Jesus' service. 
our time, our talents, our money, our prayers, our support, our knowledge, our love? What is your donkey that you can give in service of Jesus and others? You know, like the owner of the donkey in our verses today, he gave it. And, and the donkey moved Jesus forward with his plan and he entered the city. What of yours can you give to move Jesus forward into people's lives? Your voice, your song, your kindness, your witness, your hospitality? Whatever it is, give your donkey in joyful obedience to Jesus. After all, he's not only our prophet and priest, but he's also our king. The king who rode into Jerusalem on that day. Listen to the words again. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The people would say this word Hosanna because it originally meant save now. Save us. People would save us when a king would come to rescue his people. These words are also found in Psalm 118, 25, and 26. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, in addition to their words receiving the king, look at their actions. They're receiving the king as well. They spread cloaks and branches of palm trees on the road. They receive him as a king is truly received. But did they understand all that the king, what kind of king he really was? No. Some took him for an earthly ruler with the hopes that he would free them from the dreaded imposing government. Some would later in a few days would be crying, crucify him, crucify him. They had the wrong idea what kind of king he really was. But this king, this is Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is humble and gentle and riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The king who sets up his throne room, not in the city, not in a palace, not in a building made by hands, but in hearts all over the world. And he has a royal proclamation like no other king ever had, because his royal proclamation is, I forgive you and I'll give my life for you. And who wouldn't want to serve? a king like that. We needed him to ride into Jerusalem, and he did, as prophet, priest, and king. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, that ancient song we sing. Bye for now, and God bless.